I'm bringing a series of messages. And so in each of these messages, I'm giving you some information on what's going on in our world. The reason I'm giving you this message, I'll tell you my sermon right up front, and then you can go ahead and go back to sleep. Um, everybody wants to know what's going on. If you want to know what's going on, don't watch, you know, the popular news, which focuses on the United States or our city. Keep your eyes steadfastly on the Middle East, especially Jerusalem, because that's the center of Bible prophecy. You need to be aware of what's going on in Israel. So that's my message, all right? Now I'm going to talk to you about Jerusalem. On August the 21st of this year, God put it on my heart. I can't explain it other than the fact God put it on my heart to go to Israel. I had no idea what was going to happen on that trip. I had been trying to filter everything. And... Um, I got to tell you, every day God shows me more and more of what he wanted me to know while I was there in the land. Now, there's some of you that have a desire to go to Israel, but I wonder what your desire is. I wonder if you really want to get closer to God or you just want to take a vacation and just see some pretty sights. I think it's more than that when you go to Israel. I believe if you go with a heart open to know more about God. God will show you more than you could ever imagine. You see, God gave that land there to teach us things about himself. Now, look at Ezekiel chapter 5 and verse 5. And notice the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord God, This is Jerusalem. I have set it in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. Notice that phrase where the Lord said, This is Jerusalem. What do you know about Jerusalem? What do you know about it? I mean, if I asked you, What do you know about Jerusalem? Could you give me something other than a duh? I know you would, and I know most of you know the central location. I want to move quickly this morning because I have so much information to give you, but I want to share with you some things that I trust will be a blessing to you. Another verse similar to this is in Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 3. I think it's in your outline. Uh, again, keep in mind, if you want to take notes, just look at your outline, okay? It's right there. We give it to you. But in Zechariah 8 and verse 3, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem should be called the city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. On May the 14th, 2018, the American embassy was moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And on that great occasion that was seen throughout the world, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, spoke these words. He said, what a glorious day. Remember this moment. This is history. In Jerusalem, Abraham passed the greatest test of faith and the right to be the father of our nation. In Jerusalem, King David established our capital 3,000 years ago. In Jerusalem, King Solomon built our temple, which stood for many centuries. We are in Jerusalem and we are here to stay, and trust me, they mean that. The prophet Zechariah declared over 2,500 years ago, So said the Lord, I will return to Zion, and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth. Now let me give you several thoughts, and I'm going to move quickly for sake of time. But I want to show you, first of all, the allure of, of the holy city, Jerusalem. The first thought I want to give you is that it is a central city. In Psalm 48 and verse 1, the Bible says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our King, in the beauty of His holiness. And then the Bible says, Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth. Is Mount Zion in the sides of the north, the city 
of the great king. Jerusalem is mentioned in the Bible 811 times. Now the closest city next to that is Babylon, and Babylon is mentioned only 287 times in the Bible. Jerusalem appears in about two-thirds of the New Testament, and it's been called by over 70 names since its inception. The Bible tells us that to be born in Israel is a great blessing that comes from God. In Psalm chapter 87 and verse 5 and 6, the Bible says, And of Zion it shall be said, This and that man was born in her, and the highest himself shall establish her. The Lord shall count when he writeth up the people that this man was born there, Selah. You see, I would love to have been born in Jerusalem, but it wasn't God's perfect will for that. But nevertheless, God says, if you're born in the city of truth, God said it's a great honor for you. I like what Randall Price, a pastor, said about Jerusalem. He said, Jerusalem is a city at the center. It is a center of mankind's hopes and God's purposes. God loves it. Satan hates it. Jesus wept over it. The Holy Spirit descended in it. The nations are drawn to it. And Christ will return and reign in it. Indeed, the destiny of the world is tied to the future of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a central city. Secondly, Jerusalem is a chosen city. In the book of 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 44, the Bible says, The city which thou hast chosen. Let me give you, let me give you some important names of Jerusalem. The Bible refers to it in 2 Samuel 5 verse 7 and 9 as the city of David. In Psalm 87 and verse 2, it's known as Zion. In Isaiah 1 and verse 26, it's referred to as the city of righteousness. In Psalm 48 and verse 2, it's known as the city of the great king. In Isaiah 48 and verse 2, in chapter 52 and verse 1, and in Revelation 21 and verse 2, it's known as the holy city. You see, if you hadn't figured it out yet, God has some important places on this earth. And the most important place on this earth to God, and especially in Bible prophecy, is that city that we call Jerusalem. And I just walked on those streets. I just went there. In your lifetime, if it be possible, I pray to God that you'll be able to go to Jerusalem. And if not, during the millennium, God willing, <laughs> you'll be there. Now let me give you four passages in the Bible that link Jerusalem with Almighty God. 2 Chronicles 6 and verse 6 says, But I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there. In Psalm 132 verse 13 and 14 says, For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for His habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. In Psalm 87, verse 1 through 3, the Bible says, His foundation is in the holy mountains. The Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of thee, O city of God, Selah. Psalm 78, verse 67 and 68 says, Moreover, he refused the tabernacle of Joseph and chose not the tribe of Ephraim, but chose the tribe of Judah, the Mount Zion, which he loved. And, you know, as I was there, and Byron Stinson, the historian and archaeologist, and the man who came here and, you know, he, he answered your questions that you had, he pointed out that everything begins on the Holy Mount of God, and he kept referring to me that, and that's the place of righteous, that's the special person, that per, uh, place on this earth, that's where Jesus died on the cross to redeem us. You see, it has a very special place. If you've ever lost a loved one, I'm sure that the place where they ascended into heaven, whether it be a hospital, whether it be in their home, whether it be maybe at an accident. Do you ever notice how people put crosses on the side of the road where an accident took place? 
where they left. Well, that's how it is in Jerusalem because that's the place that God offered up His darling Son. Dr. Jeremiah writes about Jerusalem, and I wanted to say some things about Jerusalem, but after I read what he wrote, I thought, wow, I cannot improve on that, so I'm going to share with you. Listen closely, please. He says, and these are uh, uh, thoughts that he has uh, about Jerusalem. He says, in those moments, um, hang on, <laughs> I'm at the wrong place here. Um, he says, in those moments, it's like setting foot on the past and the other in the future. The walls and buildings are made of a kind of pale golden limestone that has taken on the name of its city, Jerusalem stone. There's always just a whiff of tension in this city because everyone knows the ground beneath their feet is the powder keg of the earth. Yet I don't feel unsafe there. Such a strange mixture of feelings. He says, I'm stirred as I wandered through the dusty streets, looking at the old shops with their bins of spices and the hordes of humanity coming and going, standing before the wailing wall and watching Israeli soldiers praying for peace before going to war, hearing the haunting church bells mingling with the mournful Islamic calls to prayer blaring from the mosque, smelling the deep fried chickpea fala falafels, I think that's how you pronounce it, at the corner stand, seeing the bearded Hasidic Jewish rabbis with side curls in their hair, walking down the Via Della Rosa and its historic stations of the cross, it's almost too much to take in. There are places in Jerusalem where I literally walk where Jesus walked. We know some of the locations where he performed his miracles, debated his enemies, and faced his execution. Most of all, I love going to the quiet beauty of the garden tomb and visualizing how it must have been on resurrection day. Having spent my life studying and teaching the Bible, when I'm in Jerusalem, it's as though I were jumping through its pages, transported to the very scenes of action. I hope I've given you a taste of the special feeling I get when visiting this holy city. So, Dr. Jeremiah clearly says that it's an emotional as well as an educational moment in that city, Jerusalem. It's, um, the Bible says it's a central city, it's a chosen city, but also according to the scripture, the Bible says it's a capital city. You see, Jerusalem became the capital of Israel by decree of King David over 3,000 years ago. In 1948, when President Harry Truman led the United States in recognizing the reborn state of Israel, the new nation reaffirmed Jerusalem as its capital. You see, in Jerusalem is where the prime minister lives. It's where the government agencies are housed. It's where the Knesset sets and where the Supreme Court presides. It's interesting, everywhere you look as you travel through Israel or especially in the city of Jerusalem, you just look, and if you have somebody with you that knows the city, they point out historical places. I was on the city bus after I'd left the train that took me from Tel Aviv into Jerusalem, and I was on the bus headed for Byron Stinson's house, and I happened to look to my right, and there I saw the Knesset, and I quickly took a picture of it. In June of 2017, the United States Senate unanimously passed a resolution 90 to 0 that reaffirmed the 1995 congressional decision and called on the president to implement it, and thank God he did. Six months later, President Donald J. Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. I challenge you to go home and look it up on YouTube. And you talk about jubilant, hysteria. There in Jerusalem, the Israeli people were elated for this event. And thank God for that. Because once again, the world was pointed to recognize Jerusalem, not Tel Aviv, 
as the capital of Israel. That's one of the largest things that we have seen in our lifetime. And I think even in this day and time, we're seeing Bible prophecy fulfill every day. We just don't realize it. We don't recognize it. We have not searched the scriptures enough to see everything in detail is being fulfilled by God Almighty exactly the way he said that it would. So we see the lure of the holy city. It's a central city. It's a chosen city. It's the capital city. Now, here's a question. What does this mean? You see, the second coming of Christ cannot happen without Jerusalem. Do you realize that? Mark Hitchcock, in his book on Bible prophecy, gives three passages of Scripture that place Jesus in Jerusalem at his second coming. I wish I had time to elaborate on these. I'm just going to give them to you quickly. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. If you ever go to Israel, everyone knows this verse. The Muslims know this verse. The Catholics know this verse. The Greek Orthodox know this verse. The Israeli people know this verse. When you tell them that you're a Christian and you're near the Mount of Olives, they'll quote Zechariah 14, 4. And they'll say, you know, Jesus is going to return to this earth. And according to Zechariah 14, 4, his feet are going to touch on the Mount of Olives. If you don't believe that, if you go to Israel, ask anyone. What does Zechariah 14, 4 mean? And they will tell you. So in other words, here's a great Bible prophecy. When Jesus returns to this earth, his feet are going to touch on the Mount of Olives. And I believe it's the exact place that he ascended into heaven. And I got to see that place, and I said, Dear Jesus, I would love for you to return and have your feet touch while I'm standing right here. But I believe as Revelation 1 verse 7 says, Every eye shall see and behold him. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, according to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. And then probably the greatest prophetical chapters in the new testament or matthew chapter 24 matthew chapter 25 and if you study those scriptures over and over jesus refers not to the united states not to iran not to saudi arabia not to the soviet union he's referring to jerusalem and he's referring that this is what you need to watch in the end time and may I tell you that everything that develops from now on in Jerusalem is significant in Bible prophecy. In Acts chapter 1, verse 9 through 11, when Jesus is recorded that he was on the Mount of Olives just before he ascended into heaven, you remember what the angel said? He says, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing into the heavens? This same Jesus which ascended into heaven shall so come in like manner, just like they saw him ascend up into the heavens till they could see him no more you're going to find that jesus every eye shall see him and he's going to descend so these are specific scripture and also the bible tells us about a 1000 year reign that's mentioned throughout scripture throughout especially the old testament and by the way the jewish people are very familiar with this thousand year reign it's known as the millennial reign. It's known as the kingdom of God that's going to be established on this earth. And that's why the Jewish people thought that Jesus was the Messiah and that he would set up his kingdom. But if you look at the book of Revelation, you find it's found six times in just chapter 20. This millennial kingdom, this city, this new Jerusalem that's going to be coming upon this earth. Dr. J. Dwight Pentecost, whom if you've ever studied Bible prophecy, you find he's known as an authority, a man who studied Bible prophecy his entire life, former president of Dallas Theological Seminary. Here's what he said. A larger body of prophetic scripture is devoted to the subject of the millennium, developing its character and conditions than any other one subject. The coming of the millennium will not be a gradual process, but rather sudden, supernatural, and apparent to the whole world. It will be preceded by a series of worldwide catastrophic events, wars, plagues, famines, and cosmic disturbances. 
It will be ushered in by a special manifestation of God and His glory. Isaiah 40, verse 5 says, All flesh shall see it together. And all of this is going to happen, not just throughout the world, but especially there in Jerusalem. And we've seen already portions of this happening right before our eyes. So my question is, how can we be so blinded to the truth that's happening right before us? In Psalm chapter 2 and verses 6 through 8, it places Jesus in Jerusalem during the millennial period. And that's found in Luke chapter 1, verse 32 and verse 33. Jerusalem will be the Messiah's millennial capital, according to Zechariah 14, verse 20 and verse 21. The everlasting capital city of Jesus throughout eternity is going to be Jerusalem. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 10 says, For he looked for a city which hath foundation, whose builder and maker is God. What was that city? It was Jerusalem, especially the new Jerusalem that I'm going to tell you about in just a moment. In Revelation 21 and verse 2, the scripture says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Now let me give you some facts about that. This is what Abraham looked for. Hebrews 11 and verse 16 says, um, hang on, I lost my place. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. God hath prepared for them a city, the Bible says. This is what Jesus promised in John chapter 14 and verse 1. Do you remember where he said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and that where I am there you may be also. This is the place. It's that new Jerusalem. And when I finish this message, I think you'll be excited whenever that's revealed to our naked eyes, to mankind, what we shall behold. Did you know that the final two chapters of the Bible use the word city 13 times in Revelation 3 and verse 12 and Revelation 21 verses 1 through 5? If I had time, I'd read those verses. But God specifically says this is a city, this is the place this is where we will spend our eternal abode. Now let me give you some facts about that. Number one, this city will be overjoyed with, or we will be overjoyed with its beauty. Let me have you look at this. If you turn over to the book of Revelation chapter 22, uh, the last chapter in the Bible, and look at verse 1, if you will. And keep in mind that John the Apostle was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. And while he was exiled there, this is where he was given this vision, he was given this revelation, so to speak. And keep in mind that this is what John penned when God revealed this great truth to him of the days to come. Revelation 22, look at verse 1. It says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now something that a lot of people don't realize is, if when you study the book of Revelation, everything in the book of Revelation centers from the throne of God. Everything that comes out that happens on this earth begins at the throne of God. You say, why is that so important, Pastor? Because it reminds us and accentuates the fact that God Almighty is in control. And whatever God decrees up in heaven is going to take place on this earth. And that's why the Lord commanded us to pray, thy will, thy will be done, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. But we will be overjoyed with its beautiful, with its beauty. Now, the Bible says that it is a city four square. Stephen Lawson helps us to understand this 
And as I'm reading this, I'm not sure, Christy, do you have the point? Uh, all right, if you look at that map, now study this map while I'm sharing this truth with you. And I want you to see the size because I think sometimes people think heaven's going to be a little bitty place and there's going to be clouds and, you know, you're going to be hearing harps and, you know, it's, it's not going to be too much. Do you realize that God spoke this world into existence? In the book of Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You find that God made everything. And I haven't traveled as much as I'd like to, but I have traveled quite a bit. I've gone to many foreign countries. I've been all over the United States in all 50 states. I have beheld some things that are absolutely beautiful. But Jesus, over 2,000 years ago, said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. And he, it didn't say, I have prepared. He said, I am preparing. Now, again, time has a different uh, uh, meaning or state than we have right now. But I want to tell you, heaven is a place of indescribable beauty that we cannot even begin to comprehend. But let me just examine to you the size of heaven and here's what Ra Stephen Lawson says. Stephen Lawson says, picture an area in the western United States between the Pacific Coast and the Mississippi River, roughly the distance from Los Angeles to St. Louis or New York to Denver. Now, that's 2,250,000,000 square miles on the ground. Then 1,500 miles up from there. And then he says, hang on, are you ready for this? That's 3 trillion, 375 billion cubic miles, enough room to comfortably accommodate 100 billion people. Now again, don't lose me. It has been estimated that approximately 30 billion people have lived in the long history of this earth. Even if everyone who ever lived was saved, which is not the case, that would still allow each person 200 square miles on the ground alone. There will be plenty of room for everyone who makes it to heaven, and that's just in this city. You see, it, it, we can't even begin to comprehend that. But you find that God specifically describes the dimensions as well as some of the beauty of this place that he has created. We are going to be overjoyed with its beauty. You know, the very second I believe that a person passes from this life into eternity, you know, according to scripture, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord that split second, they are in the realm of eternity. And they're going to behold things that they could not even begin to comprehend on this earth. And as I told someone recently, I said, why in the world do we spend so much money to stay alive whenever we can't even begin to imagine what's going to happen on the other side? And you know what we do? And I'm not scolding you if you've done this, because everybody's done this. I've done this. I think, oh, I wish they would come back. You know what they're saying whenever they get to heaven? They say, oh, I can't wait till you get here. Man, why are you waiting so long? This is a place of unbelievable beauty. But let me show you something else, and this is what we don't think about. But this is something that's important to God. Now, before I tell you this, I want to share this thought with you. Over and over, as I was there day after day, Byron Stinson kept pointing out to me that holy hill of God, the holy mount of God. And throughout scripture, you find God refers to this. This is a place where Abraham went up. Do you remember he offered up his son, Isaac, on Mount Moriah? He took his son, and he, in his heart, he was already dead. But he believed that God was either going to raise him up or that God was going to give a sacrifice. Uh, we don't know the heart of Abraham but it was a place that pictured the cross of Calvary where God the Father offered up His own Son for our justification, for our payment, for our sins. But 
here's what you got to realize. And if you're not very strong in the faith, you don't really fully understand this. Everything about God begins with His holiness. You see, He's prepared a city. But we got to realize God will not allow anything unholy to enter into this holy city. And that's why there's so many restrictions when you go to Israel, especially as you approach the Wailing Wall. Some of you may be offended because you'll be stopped. And they'll say, I'm sorry, you cannot approach, you cannot get this close to the Wailing Wall without your head covered. And really what they don't even realize, they're saying, God will not allow anybody to enter into a holy place unless they have a covering. And they don't realize that the covering really is the atonement. It's the blood atonement. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. But yet they still have reverence towards God. And they say, you can't approach God. Just, you can't just walk up to God casually. Or you cannot approach a holy place and just, whoa, that's pretty cool. No, you can't do that. You see, ladies and gentlemen, God is a holy God. And He says nothing can enter into this city unless it's holy. The word holiness means perfect. You say, well, how in the world can I ever make it to heaven? I am not perfect, Pastor. Again, the head covering pictures the atonement. When God looks at you, when you are saved, you're covered by the blood of Jesus. Just like whenever the children of Israel were told to escape Egypt, they said, you get a lamb and kill the lamb and put the blood on the doorpost. And when the angel, death angel comes by, what did he say? Do you remember? When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Tonight, we're observing the Lord's Supper. And some of you, it means nothing to you. It could be you're not even saved. But to believers, here's what God said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. God said, I purchased you, I bought you, I redeemed you. Never forget that. Now, if you're still there in Revelation, look at Revelation 21 and verse 27, the last verse in chapter 21. And again, we run over this. There's so many verses in Revelation that, you know, they don't make us feel too good, so we just skip by them. But this is one of the most important verses in the entire book of Revelation. Look at it. Revelation 21 and verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it, that means the holy city, anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now if you study the book of Revelation carefully, you find that in Revelation 20 it says, and the books were open. I believe one of the books is... A book is a testimony of your life. I believe God's going to show every unbeliever everything that happened in their life. I think God's going to show them you had this opportunity. Somebody invited you to Hickory Creek Baptist Church on this day. You sat and scribbled, drew pictures, wrote out your grocery list. You laughed at the preacher because he got loud trying to warn you. But I wanted you to believe. I wanted you to hear the gospel. And God's going to remind every person. I think another book that's, that's going to be present there is God's Word. Because God's Word is His testimony. God's Word is His law. God's Word is God's message to mankind showing us how we can personally know God. And so the Word of God is going to be there as a testimony. And I believe God's going to say, I said this to the world through my word. My word is true. And I think another book that's found there is a book called the Book of Life. Now, I believe every person's name is written in the Book of Life whenever they're conceived. I believe birth, or I believe life begins at conception. And I believe that some people, some babies that are aborted, or some babies that, you know, don't live very long, or some babies, or even some, I believe even uh, some children, I believe Scripture teaches this, 
that do not have the ability to comprehend. I believe they're covered under the atonement. But I believe that God says you were born. You were born into this world. I gave you life. And that's why at the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to be judged for those things that we did in our lives. You see, God gave you life. And now what are you doing with that life that God has given you? Some people are squandering it. Some people are just spending their life away. Isn't it amazing where you're young, all of a sudden you find you get older, and it's like, man, where did my youth go? Well, you know, most people at a young age, they do what they want to do. And then all of a sudden when they can barely walk, well, I guess I better turn to God. No, you need to turn to God when you're young and when you have a lot to give back to God. But you see, um, then there's the Lamb's Book of Life. And the Lamb's Book of Life, you see, your name is written into that Book of Life the moment that you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. And God says, you've received my Son, and He writes your name down in that book. Now, that's not my message this morning. But... Three times in Revelation 21 and Revelation 22, John called the New Jerusalem a holy city. You see this in chapter 21, verse 2, 21, verse 10, and I'm moving quickly. I believe it's in your outline in chapter 22 and verse 19. May I say this, that many cities are beautiful, but they're filled with corruption and crime. I don't know if you've ever been to San Francisco. I went to San Francisco years ago. I believe it was in the 70s or 80s. I thought it was the most beautiful city I'd ever seen in my life. But I went there recently, a year or so ago. I could not believe how that city, it just, it, it's just had a complete transformation for the worse. It's awful what's happened there. There's still natural beauty there. But you can see so much sin and corruption and neglect and abuse. and It's awful. To just go to that city now. And then let me share with you another thought. We will be overjoyed with its Savior. Revelation 22 verse 4 says, And they shall see His face. Now I wish I had time to develop all of these thoughts that I have for you. But may I tell you the greatest moment that you will ever experience in your being it's when you literally see the face of God. We can't see him in our finite bodies right now. Remember Moses said, or God told Moses, he said, no man can look at me and live. But we will behold him. Fanny J. Crosby was born blind. But she was one of the greatest hymn writers that ever lived. And she wrote these words. She said, when my life's work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and His smile will be the first to welcome me. Oh, the dear ones in glory, how they beckon me to come and are parting at the river, I recall. To the sweet vales of Eden, they will sing my welcome home. But I long to meet my Savior first of all.